Good evening, everybody. There we go. Good evening. Welcome to the 21st meeting of the Strand Group of King's College London. My name's Ashley Sweetman, and I'm one of a team of PhD students who helps John, amongst other things, to run evenings like this. The Strand Group exists to link the worlds of government, business, and academia through events, research, and teaching. We've been sponsored for many years by our friends at Hila Packard Enterprise, and their continued support makes these events possible. Tonight's event is also in partnership with the Department of War Studies at King's. A very big thank you also goes to our visiting professor, Alan Evans, Chief Executive of the British Academy, for hosting us here this evening. Dr. John Davis will chair this event, but Lord Hennessy will now introduce. Lord Hennessy. Thank you. I think I thought our dancing years were over. Yeah. Good evening, I'm Peter Hennessy. It's a great pleasure to introduce Laurie. He's been an unofficial teacher of mine for 40 years. <laughs> he's been the official teacher of many of you in this room, and he's brilliant at it. And he's going to teach us again tonight, as we shall see very shortly. And uh, his theme is Historical Research and Public Accountability, Trident, the Falklands, and Iraq. And I think Laurie will be convincing, in fact, I know he will be, to me anyway, on the utility of the scholar-analyst as an auditor of state activity of particular sensitivity, when a sense of historical context is of particular value, which is his forte. And I think in my generation, Laurie has been the outstanding figure when it comes to this. And over the four decades since he helped the Defence Select Committee look at Polaris replacement, the question of Polaris replacement, he's done the state very, very considerable service indeed. Laurie, tell us all. Peter, thank you very much, and John and the Strand Group for hosting this. Um, a lot of good and old friends here. Uh, I hope some of you will still be good and old friends at the end of this. Um, what I want to talk about um, is in part prompted by um, the Chilcot inquiry, because half a year has now passed uh, since it was published, and it seemed to be a good moment to reflect upon my experience as a historian involved in a public inquiry. In addition, because it provides an interesting contrast with the work of an inquiry, I'd also want to draw on my role as an official historian of the Falklands campaign. Trident comes in because much earlier in my career, I used to see, first saw lot of that man, uh, I tried to work out how to research British nuclear policy at a time when as much effort was put into deterring outside scrutiny as there was into deterring the Russians. Accepting roles as a, an official historian uh, and as a member of an official inquiry introduces two forms of accountability. On the one hand, there is the challenge of holding ministers, officials, officers directly to account, but on the other, of respecting the degree of personal accountability that this position, these positions entail. So let me make it clear from first that I'm talking for myself and not on behalf of the other members of the Chilcot Inquiry. While I'm going to talk about what the experience meant for me as a historian, my contribution was only part of the larger effort led by John Kilt Chilcott. We were very much a team supported by an excellent secretariat as well as first class legal and military advisors. And to get the disappointment over quickly, I'm not going to be offering startling revelations uh, about the workings of the inquiry. This is largely because its work and its workings were relatively straightforward. Uh, despite the pre-publication comments about the length of the report and the time it has taken, uh, and the time it, it taken, the reasons for this, I think, became apparent on publications. At the time, the media speculation was intrusive, irritating, especially, I think, the repetitive joke about whether Godot would arrive before the report, each time offered as if was, this was a unique moment of humour. <laughs> Uh, still, what was remarkable, and for this I give credit to John's leadership, uh, was that as a group we stuck together, our findings did not leak in advance, our disagreements rarely touched on the broad thrust of the report, and were always settled without fuss. And compared with other inquiries, 
who are not at all expensive. <coughs> Academics and former mandarins come at a discount to lawyers. What role can a historian play in an inquiry? In our normal publications, we can challenge popular misconceptions and encourage reappraisals of characters everybody thought they knew well. In doing this, we're rarely shy about expressing opinions on the great figures or even great events of the past. Historians can take views on the diplomacy of Disraeli, generalship of Haig or Montgomery, the management of the Irish issue in the 19th century, or even whether we might have held on to America in 1776. But as we do so, we're accountable largely to our peers, to our publishers. Um, we're fortunate to live in a country which allows for the possibility uh, that we may have as a nation and misunderstood our own past, and in which it is possible to, chal ch to challenge cherished national myths. Other than those flurries of excitement when a minister appears to suggest that there are not enough monarchs or battles in the school curriculum, or when they suggest there's nothing to be ashamed of in any British activity over the past century, the state stays out of the practice of history. That is why the very notion of an official historian properly invites a degree of suspicion, as it suggests that the, this essential independence um, has been compromised for the sake of privileged access to archives. But it says a lot for the British tradition of academic freedom that even when the state is sponsored, uh, none of the official historians I have ever spoken to felt politically pressured or compromised in any way. I certainly didn't. This is where the pages get mixed up. Um, so despite this tradition, especially nurtured in the official histories programme, which I hope can be kept going, um, historians have not played a formal role in public inquiries. The possibility was certainly discussed when the Franks Committee was being put together, but in the end the government opted for a mixture of politicians and public servants. Otherwise, the tendency has been to rely on the judiciary for the skills necessary to address questions of wrongdoing and administrative failings. There is an understandable view that lawyers not only know how to get at the facts, but also the proper care that needs to be taken when forming judgments that may affect reputations and even lead to criminal proceedings. Historians have a different approach to evidence. They're less inclined to follow rules about what is admissible, more inclined to pay attention to hearsay and even gossip, more interested in the assumptions of the time and the overall context in which events are taking place. They're often less concerned about individual responsibility than what an event may reveal about larger forces of work <coughs> in the social, economic and political spheres. A lawyer knows to answer the question that has been asked. The, the historian is always looking for more interesting questions. These tendencies may make historians uncomfortable contributors to the formalities and disciplines of an official inquiry. In the past also, historians might have felt that events under consideration were just too fresh for any serious historical inquiry, that really decades should pass before they weighed in. Only with the passage of time could a proper perspective be reached and would the necessary archives become available. The first of these objections to contemporary history still has some force. It becomes easier to make sense of events the more we know about what followed. For example, the decision not to go after Saddam Hussein in 1991 at the end of Desert Storm looked to be unwise in the subsequent decade as he continued to defy the international community, but then not so stupid uh, after 2003 when the problems of occupying Iraq became apparent. But what this tells us is that we interpret events in terms of the preoccupations of our time. That's also the case even if one is looking at the Crusades or the English Civil War. The passage of time rarely settles such debates, as we can see with the continuing arguments over the origins of the First World War. <laughs> at any rate, there's still something about the historical method in terms of evaluating evidence and placing it in context that makes it of value even when trying to understand the present. The second objection, that it's necessary to wait until the evidence is available, no longer has such force. It used to be a long wait before the archives were opened, 
Until the Public Records Act of 1967, it was 50 years. The weight then went down to 30 and is moving now to 20. So it's not so long. And of course, the process of record check keeping has changed, not really for the better, with the amount of government business that is left unrecorded growing with the use of phones and emails. One reason for this, that offers some mitigation, is the tendency for so much to be leaked almost immediately or to be soon disclosed. This is thanks to the Freedom of Information Act and the speed with which former ministers, officials and officers rush to print with their memoirs and diaries. For all these reasons, contemporary history is now much more respectable and in its own way much more rewarding. And to illustrate this point, let me uh, start with my experience as a graduate researcher in the early 70s. The limits of official secrecy were very real, uh, especially if you wanted to work on nuclear matters as I did. For my PhD, I focused on how uh, intelligence e uh, estimates influenced US nuclear pol uh, possible, uh, policy. There was no way I could have done anything comparable on British nuclear policy. Uh, there had been the remarkably revealing official histor histories conducted by Margaret Gowing on the early years of the British nuclear program, uh, which incidentally set valuable precedents for later his histories in exploring uh, policy failures uh, and ineptitude, as well as acknowledging real achievements. The question of whether Britain was capable of remaining a nuclear power, which was only settled by the American offer of the Pol Polaris submarine launch mis missiles in December 1962 at the Nassau summit, was also well covered at the time and subsequently. But only the briefest details were available about subsequent policy choices. From 1965 to 1980, there were no parliamentary debates and official statements were confined uh, to promises to, uh, main, uh, to not to move to a new generation of missiles while maintaining the effectiveness of the deterrent. In the late 1970s, it was perfectly clear that the issue of Polaris replacement could not be delayed much longer. Now at Chatham House, I supported Ian Smart's um, pathbreaking study of this issue. As was normal practice at Chatham House, a study group was set up to advise him. All government officials were told to stay away. This experience led me to try to write a book on Britain and nuclear weapons, pulling together whatever I could and the publisher is actually over there, just gave me a smile, I'm going to see Norton. Um, uh, pulling together whatever I could actually find out about UK nuclear policy. The answer was not a lot until the government changed in May 1979. Soon there was more openness on policy. I was now able to get some proper background material on recent decision making, helped, I should say, by some great investigative work published in the Times by one Peter Hennessy. It turned out that far more preparatory analysis of the options had been going on under the Labour government uh, than they had let on, and also that they had presided over a new warhead programme, Chevaline, that had suffered cost delays and overrun. The official historian of that programme is also sitting over there. Uh, the secrecy was more about not causing trouble for the Labour Party than protecting national security. The result, especially in the case of Chevaline, was that an expensive programme was not subjected to proper scrutiny. Because of this work, I joined, invited to join the new Select Committee on Defence uh, as an advisor. The first inquiry was an investigation into Polaris replacement. The politics of the situation were too delicate to permit an agreed report, but the inquiry did get on record much more material about nuclear programmes and policy. The committee also followed this up with annual reports on Trident from which it was possible to monitor progress, which I think led to a more relaxed attitude towards secrecy. There was also the famous Ministry of Defence Open Government document on the nuclear programme, drafted by Michael Quinlan, a man who was committed to keeping people informed. The annual defence estimates of the time became more false, fulsome in their explanations of policy. So I do think the early 80s was a turning point. As the recent rumours, uh, the recent rumpus over the failure of a missile test demonstrates, it's yet to be fully appreciated to gov in government that withholding information just because its release would be inconvenient uh, makes things worse 
um, over the longer term. The prime exhibit here from the early 1980s, about which I'll say a bit more in a moment, is the sinking of the General Belgrano during the Falklands campaign. The government got itself into a complete tangle to avoid acknowledging that the Defence Secretary had inadvertently been misleading in his original announcement. The lesson I learned from my work on nuclear policy was that any authoritative information which is disclosed without fuss, even if it illuminates a matter of major importance, even if it contains the seeds of a great scandal, will generally get minimal media attention compared with almost any information that has been leaked. This is because of the widespread assumption in the media that the only stuff that is worth knowing is that which the government doesn't want you to know. The trouble with leaks, which are often a godsend to contemporary <coughs> historians, is the information tends to be, to be sensationalized or decontextualized. I recall the headlines generated by leaks in the New Statesman about the size of the UK nuclear stockpile and the complete inattention when the actual numbers were released as part of the 1998 defence review by a Labour government now acting quite differently from its predecessors. Now, of course, the great advantage of being an official historian and a member of an official inquiry is that getting hold of information is the least of your worries. The archives are handed to you on a plate, including stuff that will never get to the National Archives. You can interview, even interrogate, key players. That's how they lure you in. The process, however, is not that straightforward. First, you have to know what to ask for. This may seem a small point, but it isn't, because where vital material has been filed away, it's not always self-evident, nor has it always been done carefully. That is why it's uh, vital to have a, a secretary to an inquiry who knows the system, in the case of Chilcot, Margaret Aldred. When you're putting together a paper trail, it really helps to have somebody around who knows what those paper trails normally look like. Uh, and therefore, where the gaps uh, in what has been handed over are likely to be, or which bit of government would normally be addressing a particular issue. One feature of the Chilcot process was the number of times government departments were asked to have another look, uh, not because they'd hidden things, but because there was clearly something missing, often leading to that something being found. Secondly, there are protocols to be respected about the handling of intelligence material, especially if it could reveal too much about methodology, and also about material that, if released, could cause problems with foreign powers or national security more widely. The challenges come when these restrictions might lead to misleading impressions or huge gaps in the analysis. The Iraq inquiry had to push very hard to make sure relevant cabinet min minutes, joint intelligence committee assessments, and especially correspondence and conversations between Prime Minister Blair and President Bush were released, although in the latter case the Bush bits had to be left off. The amount released was justified on the basis of the exceptional nature of the inquiry, so that it was not blatantly precedent-setting. The point was that with a topic where there was already so much suspicion of cover-ups and whitewashes, the material withheld had to be kept to an absolute and explicable minimum. Third, there's a complex interaction between what is already in the public domain and what one might like to get into the public domain. With the Falklands, for example, Nobody seemed to mind very much about what I included uh, from the American side. So you can read verbatim what President Reagan and Secretary of State Haig said to Margaret Thatcher. But I still came up against special rules. One was about neither confirming nor denying the presence of nuclear weapons at sea, although one of the fascinating stories in this case was the nuclear depth charges uh, taken to the South Atlantic. Another was about saying anything about code breaking, despite the, the importance of this facility in the Belgrano case. Then there was the recent prohibition against reporting on the activities of special forces, whose role had been crucial during the campaign. And I was also urged uh, to say absolutely nothing about cooperation with Chile. In all these cases, what was in the public domain was helpful. In a negative sense, quite misleading claims had been made which only with the right information could be refuted. This is why 
in the end, I managed the first official reference since the ultra revelations to decryption of another country's military communications. More positively, people who knew had already written about these things. Thus, Julian Thompson had written about the role of special forces when he was actually still in charge of them. Um, and Lady Thatcher had spoken about Chile's support when she'd come to the defence of General Pinochet. Without so much material, not all of it right, uh, out there already, I would have had much more trouble getting out a full and adequate account. Of course, the guardians of official secrecy frown on someone who, having seen the primary material, quotes a secondary source, as that gives the source authority. <coughs> Nonetheless, it's a very tempting way around the problem, created by restrictions, especially when the secondary source is in the form of a memoir or a diary. You may have noted some examples in Chilcot. Fourth, an official status gives access, one access to people as well as to documents. A good witness might fill in gaps in the evidence or stop you veering wildly off course or bring home the pressure of events, although memories in the end are fallible and always best checked against the documentary evidence uh, where possible. In the case of Iraq, there were hearings. I suspect for many people, these were the main thing they wanted from the inquiries. Of the inquiry. They wanted to see those responsible as searching questions in public. This is why, incidentally, it was never realistic to expect this stage of the inquiry to be held in private. That is also why the hearings had to be held early. I think they would have been more useful, have made maximisation easier if they'd been later, but in the circumstances that was not an option. Views differed as to how well we did with our interrogations. Many of my learned friends tended to be unimpressed uh, because they saw this as a job for proper lawyers. We took the view, which I'm sure was right, that as soon as one lawyer was directly involved with the proceedings, they would have been all over the place, uh, as witnesses would have brought their own, advising them to say as little as possible, third parties would have demanded their own rep representation, and so on. By and large, especially with non-politicians, I think the process worked well. And a number, I know a number of those involved who found the chance to describe their experiences welcome and therapeutic. Fifth, there is a duty to be reasonably comprehensive with what one covers. When writing a book for academics or general readers, there's always a tendon, te temptation to leave out or compress the boring stuff. This can create its own problems. A lack of attention, for example, to questions of logistics in discussions of conflicts means neglecting the factor that can make or break <coughs> operations. The core story of the Falklands campaign was about the creations, pressures created by the limited amount of kit which the to, uh, with which the task force uh, was supplied uh, and the long change to get it resupplied. The fact that the problems of asset tracking, which had been highlighted in 1991 after Desert Storm, were still present in 2003, was important not only in explaining the problems faced then, but as an example of a failure to learn key lessons from a previous campaign. To take another example from the inquiry, the exploration of the duty of care to civilians brings home as much as any other section of the report why it was hard to uh, accomplish as much in Iraq as the security situation deteriorated. Six, then there is the question of what one does with the information received. Other than this question of comprehensiveness, I approach the official history of the Falklands largely as I would have approached any other big project. The task imposed a degree of sobriety on the writing. This was not an occasion for polemics or playfulness, but the task seemed to me to be one of explaining events as well as I could, so there was a good record of what had happened and why. It was still what I'd call tip of the iceberg writing. And there was likely to be a lot more behind each paragraph than, that, than could possibly be included. A few files worth of papers could be condensed into a page of text. With the inquiry, it was quite different. It soon became evident that the tip of the iceberg would not su suffice. The whole iceberg had to be exposed to view. We could not assume that our judgments would be taken on trust. 
I haven't checked this with my colleagues, but I think at first we did hope that we could meet a timetable that now looks a bit absurd by perusing the documents, reflecting on the hearings, and then producing a relatively short report. This just couldn't be done. Not only was the chronology quite complicated, but also many different types of issues were raised by events taking place over eight years. Most important was the question of accountability. If we were going to hold people to account, then we had to provide the evidence upon which we were basing our judgments. Equally, because of the widespread expectations of a whitewash and the fact that previous inquiries on the intelligence side had not put the issue to rest, the only way we could hope to satisfy our wider audience was providing as much evidence as possible. One thing that was never a problem with the Iraq inquiry was the burden of high expectations. This is why the report was so long um, and is written as a chronicle of events with occasional commentary. In some way, this approach reflected uh, more that of my dear colleague, uh, the late Sir Martin Gilbert, whose loss was such a heavy blow than, uh, than my approach. The, the chairman stressed from early on the importance of a reliable account, and that is what we strived to produce. In my mind, success with the report would come if its contents were generally accepted as being fairful and reliable, calming rather than reigniting the controversies and letting people move on. Some of you here may disagree, but I think that's more or less what we <coughs> achieved. If we had been confined to the decisions leading up to March 2003, the task would obviously not have taken so long, but nor could we have set out the consequences of the decisions or shown how much was left unresolved even as hostilities began. This was, after all, supposed to be a lessons learned inquiry, and many of the lessons were about the aftermath. Lastly, what about the role of holding others to account? This was an unavoidable task of the inquiry, but not really of the official history. In early writing, uh, for example, the book I did on Kennedy, I expressed anxiety about the idea of history as indictment. I was always more interested in working out what had happened and passing judgments. But in these cases, critical judgments were expected. With the Falklands, the big issue was the sinking of the Balgrana. But actually, by the time I was appointed official historian, I'd already sought to debunk, debunk the core accusation that the motives behind the sinking were more political than military, designed not so much to torpedo a ship which posed little threat at the time, but instead to torpedo a new Peruvian-led peace initiative. In a review in the Times Literary Supplement in March 84 of one of the main books alleging the conspiracy, I challenged the supposition that any Argentine signals would have been intercepted and decoded almost immediately and done so in time to influence cabinet decisions. Later, I was fortunate uh, to, to uh, work with an Argentinian colleague, Virginia Gamba, who had access to Argentine materials. We were able to work out there was a vital confusion um, in a statement from the chief of the Argentine Navy as the order he had suggested had been sent as early as 8 o'clock on the 1st of May to withdraw was in fact one to initiate offensive operations. And once you work that out, then things fell into place more easily. The most remarkable thing when I eventually got into the archives um, was, how uh, was how substantial the post-war files on the Belgrano were compared to those on the actual incident. As with all conspiracy theories, one thing led to another. Remember the missing logs from HMS Conqueror and even the suggestions to a link to the murder of a pensioner, Hilda Morell. While reviews of the official history picked on, up on the fact that there had not been a cover-up on the Belgrano, they missed noting at least three other areas where I had identified cover-ups. Let me briefly mention them now. First, the Board of Inquiry into the loss of HMS Sheffield had identified examples not only of bad luck but of poor practice. In Admiral Fieldhouse had decided against a court-martial on the grounds it would be to little purpose in any way we'd won the war. Secondly, grossly inflated claims were made about the success of our air defence systems, and in particular, rapier in taking down Argentine aircraft. This was exposed in a book by Ethel and Price uh, on the air war, 
where they showed that instead of the 14 aircraft being brought down by rapier with another six probable, as claimed in the December 1982 government white paper on the conflict, the actual number was probably only one. Uh, the Select Committee on Defence, which I was still advising, asked for a reconciliation of these numbers as part of an inquiry into weapons performance in the Falklands. As pitches for arms sales had been made on the basis of the inaccurate figures, MOD was reluctant to acknowledge the awkward truth. At first it prevaricated, and then when it could no, do so no longer, it relied successfully on a quiet word with the committee chairman to drop the issue. Third, the Franks inquiry had allowed itself to be swayed by the intelligence community's own investigation as to when the decision uh, was taken in Buenos Aires to invade the Falklands. By putting this decision at the very latest date possible, 31st of March, 82, it encouraged the view that it was in some way a function of domestic unrest in Argentina, and certainly too late for it to be picked up in the, uh, by the UK. The actual day, 26th of March, made the decision more comprehensible in terms of the dynamics of the crisis, and more regrettable that it had been missed. Now, all these three issues were set out in my book, you know, I do not recall any of them being picked up in the media. I didn't make any attempt to draw anyone's attention to it. To some extent, I felt that I'd done my job by not sustaining the cover-ups. In addition, and this is a big difference with the Iraq inquiry, I really didn't see it as my job as one of the signing blame. I didn't name, for example, any of those responsible on the Sheffield. I felt uncomfortable with the idea that I could hand out judgments without any right of reply. There's no maximalization with an official history. But the lesson I draw from this reinforces the previous one about information that's been extracted from an unwilling government as being far more interesting as that which is disclosed as a matter of course. Having an account of events in the public domain that does raise questions of accountability makes very little difference unless someone is prepared to make a big deal of it. This needs to be kept in mind with regular demands for transparency and full disclosure. It still requires interpretation, and even then, what makes the headlines and what is ignored can be remarkably arbitrary. <coughs> with the inquiry, while the chairman made clear from the start that we were not a court of law and could not rule on any illegality, we were not going to resolve from passing judgments on the parts played by individuals. That wouldn't be right for me now to go into individual cases. Um, and you can still read it all online. But I want to instead to conclude by reflecting on the problems with acting as a historian when the findings are politically loaded. As I do so, let me stress again that I was but one member of the inquiry panel, and these re remarks reflect my own views. This lecture should have been entitled With the Benefit of Hindsight. Um, hindsight captures what is really so satisfactory about being a historian, but also what seems so unfair uh, to those castigated for past actions, which now appear to have been in error. Senior policymakers enveloped by a crisis can only guess how the events of which they are a part will end. As they try to discern a way forward, they may feel battered, even exhausted, by the rush of events. Messages will be coming at them from all directions. Particularly hectic moments will find them glancing at bits of paper put in front of them while trying to conduct a conversation on the phone, aware that a colleague is hovering close by, desperate to make an important intervention. Some may even be checking a monitor for emails or media reports. Their view will always be partial, even at the very top of government. As they struggle to come to terms with, with, with what others want them to know, policymakers may suspect that there is more interesting material being kept from them. Meanwhile, they rely on fragmentary intelligence and speculative assessments to tell them what rivals or enemies are up to. This particular crisis may well be one of a number of issues that are being decided at once. In most circumstances, policymakers might argue, the remarkable thing is not that they make mistakes, but that they get anything right at all. When they do get things right, of course, when the story has ended on a positive note, perhaps a great victory achieved, the benefits of hindsight seem slight compared <laughs> with the wisdom of foresight. So long as individuals are prepared to take credit for the positive, then we don't need to let them off the hook when considering the negative. But with both the positive and the negative, 
it's important to recognise the role of luck and chance and the nature of the uncertainties and risks surrounding any big decisions. Working backward from whatever the outcome produces, a different picture than working forward from a broad mass of material, lots of background noise, in which one is aware all the time of possibilities still open and choices to be made. They produce different outcomes. This is why the only fair test when evaluating judgment is was a decision reasonable given what was known at the time? And it was a test that the inquiry sought to apply. The benefits of hindsight are considerable, especially when this is combined with privileged access to archives and to people. This provides a perspective unavailable to those making the actual decisions. It's possible to take a holistic view, to map out what everybody was up to in a way that would have been impossible to know at the time. Files from across government can be checked and the distribution noted, showing who was in and out of the loop. The key actors can be identified as part of an inner circle, which may not always reflect formal titles. These days, the historian might be lucky to have access to anything more than a smattering of telephone transcripts and emails, especially now that the potentially incriminating value of conversational messages has been recognised. But available documents can be read carefully, undoubtedly more so than when they were first circulated, so that subtleties or underlying assumptions can be picked up that might have been missed completely by the original correspondence. The chronology can be established and patterns noted. Most importantly, the historian knows how the story, or at least this particular episode, ends. Precisely because of this hindsight, um, it, it can encourage historians to highlight the traces of decisions to come which may give them a salience far greater than they had at the time. There is a risk of policy making appearing too neat and tidy, and too compartmentalised, missing what else was going on at the time and how they interacted. Some aspects of policy making, such as the critical question of who hated whom within government, uh, can be hard to discern. While the impact, of, the impact of these personal relationships may lack evidence yet provide the simplest explanation of poor communication or coordination. Sometimes historians can impose a pattern of events that only works because so much is ignored or allowed to fade into the background. This discrepancy between the perspectives of the policymaking looking forward and the historian looking back is a good reason for the historian to take care when evaluating policymakers. This is why many are reluctant to indulge in too much editorialising as they recognise that they do enjoy an unfair advantage. The historian can illuminate the context in which decisions were taken, the factors that were given excessive weight and those too little, report on their effects and know their unintended consequences. But this needs to be done with a degree of humility as they do this without the burden of responsibility. I think the fact that the inquiry knew that its work would be fully scrutinised helps in this regard and encouraged us to put so much emphasis on the reliable account so that people could see for themselves the foundations for our judgments and have the material to form judgments of their own. For that reason, I hope in the end, Chilcot helps rather than hinders current and future policymakers, not by threatening them with being Chilcotted in the future if it all goes wrong, but to encourage them to keep on asking questions about the course upon which they are set. Looking back, Robert McNamara wrote in his book, In Retrospect, I clearly erred by not forcing a knock-down, dragged-out debate about the loose assumptions, unmasked questions, and their thin analyses underlying our military strategy in Vietnam. I had spent 20 years as a manager identifying problems and forcing organisations, often against their will, to think deeply and realistically about alternative courses of action and their consequences. I doubt if I will ever fully understand why well, I did not do it here. With the benefit of hindsight, it remains a shame that too little of that took place when the vital decisions on Iraq were being taken from early 2002 to March 2003. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lloyd. Um, Peter?
Over to you. Thank you, Laurie. That was terrific. Listening to you on the hindsight problem reminded me of the preface to David Markham's very fine biography of Ramsay MacDonald. He said the biographer, but I think this applies generally to historians, must avoid the temptation to become some kind of celestial chief justice, apportioning blame and praise with posterity in mind. And I've always found this a problem, sitting in the archives at Kew, where I spent a high, high proportion of my life, I suppose, wanting to <laughs> shout at people in cabinet committees, saying, surely you must have realised even then. And it's a terrible temptation. But you've, uh, you've caught it very well, actually, if I may say so. Um, can I ask you a couple of questions, thoughts that come out of it, really? Was there any complication for you as an individual in the Chilcot inquiry, in that you were not just an auditor, but you've been to some extent a player because I think you had a hand in drafting Tony Blair's Chicago speech and there were people who thought that you should have recused yourself, I think that's the verb, because of it. I happen to be not one of them, but it came up. Did it affect you? Did you worry about that? Um, it certainly came up. Um, almost as soon as uh, it was announced, I think it was Michael Crick, um, uh, decided to recall a conversation he and I had had together uh, I mean, the, 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 my role in the Chicago speech was, 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 was no, uh, but he, he recalled this. Um, and so the next morning, um, I, I recall listening to the Today program while David Miliband was being forced to defend my inclusion um, on, the, uh, on the inquiry um, uh, with the accusation that I was Tony Blair's placement. Uh, I remember my wife turning around to me and saying, well, how does it feel to be a puppet of a puppet? <laughs> um, uh, uh, it, it was a problem. Um, and we dealt with it by uh, putting, actually, my draft um, that I'd sent to uh, Jonathan Powell in April 1999, uh, uh, on the inquiry website, mm. uh, so people could see what I'd written. And if I actually read it and looked at the five tests that were set down there um, that one might wish to follow before one engaged in uh, an intervention of this sort, um, the first one of which was, are you sure of your case? Another one of which is, are we prepared for the long term? Um, another one of which, um, uh, have all diplomatic options being exhausted, you might have thought that actually this wasn't too bad. And to be fair to Tony Blair, in, in his memoir, he actually said that about the five tests. And mm. looking at them, you could see this was, things were quite evenly balanced. So I had, I had a, a ready-made spiel uh, about why uh, uh, it wasn't disqualifying. Um, but it led, I mean, it led to an assumption that from some people that that's what I was there for. The other odd thing, which is it sort of slightly links in with the official history, um, was it so happened that one of the first decisions Blair took as Prime Minister was to um, sign me off as official historian of the Falklands. Um, if, it, if John Major had won, he'd have been asked to do exactly the same thing. Um, but because Blair had done it, uh, this was, I mean, I remember in the Times, an extraordinary complicated and convoluted argument as why well. I've, I've been given this job in order to do something to the uh, Conservatives' reputation over the Falklands. And it was a bit of a surprise that it hadn't had quite that effect. You know, I, I never realised that people were thinking those things. I just thought I was doing a bit of history. Um, so, yeah, it made a difference. But I, I think uh, in the end, you know, it, it, there I was. There's not much I could do about it. It wasn't the worst thing that was said about me. Can you um, briefly say if there were any elements, just one element from each of Iraq and Falklands that surprised you once you, once you had your special access? Is there something that leapt off the page and biffed you that you hadn't felt, hadn't even sensed before? Well, um, the Falklands is easy because it was the first moment that I, um, I started looking at the War Cabinet minutes. Um, and it's one of those moments when you just regret there's nobody you can talk to about this. Because I, there had been an issue about nuclear weapons in the South Atlantic. Mm. Uh, but that was largely about r ridiculous claims about uh, Polaris. Yeah. Um, and I took it nonsense. And then, you know, the, 
early days of the war cabinet, this big issue about what the hell do we do about these nuclear depth charges going to the South Atlantic because we dare take them off at Ascension because all these journalists will see them uh, and that will create ructions. So off they went to the South Atlantic. Then they got worried that once they were there, they were going to end up in the bottom of the sea. Um, and so complicated means had to be found to get them home again. Now, you know, again, no harm was done by this, um, but it was quite a story and enormously frustrating that <laughs> I just had to give it to myself for a number of years. Um, so that was the thing. I think, I think with Iraq, it's hard to know. I mean, you spent so long with the evidence. I, I, I mean, I'm not, you know, Roderick was here or, or Margaret Marty, but I mean, I think I was always just staggered uh, the more we found out about it by, you know, we knew there were problems with the aftermath, but just, you know, how much those problems mm -hmm. had not been addressed beforehand. I mean, I think that's what struck me personally. I mean, a lot of the stuff on the intelligence and so on, you know, was really mm -hmm. interesting. And some of the stuff on the diplomacy was quite fascinating. Uh, I mean, you know, there's, there's lots of fascinating, you know, other historians, I hope, will make good use, not me, but other historians will make good use of the material in the, uh, in the, the inquiries produced and the documents coming out. But I think that, that, that remains with me as the biggest uh, uh, impression. I knew there was a problem, but I was surprised by how little effort had been made to prepare for it. Finally, how much of what you learned as an official historian and indeed as an inquirer into Iraq that was truly secret will you have to take to the grave with you? <laughs> Give us a clue. <laughs> if I told you that, somebody here would have to shoot me. Uh, Discretion uh, is my second religion. <laughs> Actually, you know, the, the, at one point um, during the Falklands, I, I went to GCHQ. Um, I should say, when, when I was appointed, one of the first visits I had was from GCHQ, in which it was explained to me in very simple language uh, that the policy of GCHQ was that nothing, but nothing at all, should ever appear on, uh, about code breaking. Not just about SIGIN, about, never mind GCHQ, just about SIGIN. Every time I was told something appears, Everybody they were trying to target looks at their codes. So the simplest thing was to say nothing at all. And I thought this would be extremely difficult. Uh, later on, they had a guy, you will remember, Peter... Freeman? Freeman, Peter Freeman, who sadly uh, died uh, as their official historian, who was tremendous. I mean, Peter was just tremendous. And I believe he was involved in the butler, uh, in helping the butler as well. And he actually helped me round um, a lot of... Problems. But anyway, I went, I went to GCHQ and looked at the SIGIN, and I just thought, oh gosh, wow. Uh, and there's absolutely no point, absolutely no point in me reading any more of it, because none of it I could use. And the, and the line I took was, unless it had actually come through an influenced policy, the fact that there was this sort of raw stuff around was just a level too far, and, and I'd rather not know. Others, as you know as well as I do, an awful lot of the stuff that you see marked secret has appeared in The Economist. Indeed, you may have written some of it. Um, uh, and, um, you know, it, it's less surprising. You know, the languages in which it's expressed, the detail, the stuff that um, people didn't really pay attention to because nothing came of it. There's, all, there's always those things. But actually, um, I'm sure there is something in there, but, but it's so well looked after that, that I've forgotten it. Very tactful. Thank you, Laurie. Over, you. Over to you, John. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK. We've got about 25 minutes for questions. Um, I think we've got roving mics. We do indeed. Um, can I have name? Can I have affiliation? Uh, who is first, please? I've got a hand over here. Right over there. Hello, Claire Evans from Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Um, I was fascinated by your comments around the, um, the whitewash and the Chilcot inquiry. Oh. From your experience, do you think uh, an official inquiry into something as controversial as the Iraq war could ever satisfy the rapacious media that we enjoy? Well, I don't think it didn't do a bad job. I, I mean, as I said, you know, <laughs> uh, 
one of the daring things I did during the course of the inquiry was to go on Twitter. Um, and I, I never, ever tweeted about Chilcot. And to be fair to the media, who were also on Twitter, some who were here, um, nor did they ever ask me about it. Um, so I, I stayed away from it. But I obviously watched what other people were saying. And it was, you know, part of it, and also when the Daily Mail was running its campaign and so on. Um, you know, because I knew what we were doing, it, it just thought, well, you know, we, we, can, we can keep on protesting that that's not what's happening, but it won't make any difference. The, all we ever said was, wait till you see the report, when people saw the report. Um, you know, I think one of the, um, I, I wish I had it with me, but one of my favourite moments uh, was in Private Art. Um, when uh, they had this, you know, this sort of, uh, sort of contrast to what, you know, an apology, uh, where they said in contrast to the whitewashing so on that you'd been led to expect, actually this was something which did what it was supposed to do. Um, even the Daily Mail, um, how, having run an important campaign, I think, against our chairman in particular, uh, acknowledged that we, you know, we got the stuff out. So um, I think, I think the way we did it is probably the only way to do it. However which is to get the information out. Um, uh, you know, and I said this wasn't you know, my initial view, but it just became evident as we went on that, that it was the only way to do it. And then if people, you know, I, I went to the, the uh, some book, uh, Edinburgh Festival book thing, and the first question, you know, how can you do this about, say this about Alistair Campbell and so on? I said, well, so what, what particularly about section four of our report did you disagree with? Well, you know, they, you know it's all there. If you, want, if you want to see why we came to the conclusions we did, um, it's there. And I think that, that, that's the only way of dealing with it. Thank you. Over, over here, please. Uh, John Tolson, a Minister of Defence. Um, as you said, it's six months since you reported on, on Chilcot, rather longer since the, the Falklands official history. Could you perhaps give us some insights on how you see um, government, perhaps Whitehall and the senior civil service more than most, have actually taken on board what you've written about and your conclusions, and whether we're going to see a situation where um, Chilcot just gets filed, and thank Christ that's over, uh, is, is the view, or whether there actually is a real appetite for, for change on the basis of it? Well, all I can say is I know government departments have, are doing things. I mean, I know, um, I've been in touch with the Ministry of Defence and Foreign Office, I think Cabinet Office as well, um, are sort of having their lessons learned operations. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think there is an appetite to learn. There's another part of me which, you know, doesn't want them to overlearn, in a sense. You know, one of, one of the problems is that, you know, what, you know, it's like the generals fighting the last war. Um, it seems to me that the basic, the basic lesson, uh, and we didn't, you know, we didn't produce 650 small administrative changes necessary to... to you know, to ensure this thing doesn't happen again. The basic lessons are about being self-critical and challenging, and challenging yourself, uh, and thinking about the long term, thinking about uh, the consequences. That's quite a simple lesson to be learned. Um, but it's actually very difficult in practice to remember just because of the pressure of events, the commitments that have been made. So, you know, well, you know the basic lesson, I hope, is a still small voice. Um, in somebody's ear every time you're moving into this sort of thing is, are, are you absolutely sure? If you are, fine, go ahead. But are, are there, there's some, a lot of particular things, some of the um, procurement issues and so on, some rigidity of care issues, um, where I hope, you know, lessons are I mentioned the asset tracking one. Um, you know, you, you would hope eventually, by the time we get into conflict some, uh, in the future, when a whole lot of stuff arrives at a distant shore, we can actually work out uh, how it's been packaged um, and, and, uh, and where it is. Thank you. Uh, John Gearson from King's College. Um, Laura, you've taken us through uh, your life of scrutiny. Um, we had Butler, we had Chilcot now. 
Um, do you want to reflect on where scrutiny might go next? I mean, is this the beginning of a, of a series of, of Chilcot-like inquiries, uh, or is it rather going to be, uh, as, as you wrote about defence inquiries, uh, or defence reviews, rather, in, in the 80s, uh, so cautionary that another one doesn't come for a long time? Well, you know, the way you hope there aren't going to be many more inquiries, because you wouldn't have had an inquiry like this unless people hadn't said things had gone wrong. Um, I mean, the, you know, one of the differences between the Falklands and Iraq is, you know, you always have that sense with the Falklands that this was quite an achievement. Uh, you know, this was, um, uh, and in the end it had worked out okay. In fact, all modern wars, the Falklands is one where you can argue, obviously, there's a lot of, you know, there's greater loss of life with the Falklands than there was in Iraq. British side wants to keep that in mind. Um, but, you know, the, it, it, uh, the British government got uh, took the Falkland down and certainly did very well out of it and, and now prospering, whereas if it hadn't been for the war, they would probably now be uh, uh, living in the South Hebrides or something. Um, and um, probably good for Argentina too, because they've got rid of the hunter. Um, so there was sort of a, a vaguely positive feel about that, whereas, you know, you were dealing uh, with something which hadn't been great for the country, um, and that's difficult. I mean, it's not what one, li one likes to do. So I hope um, that you know, if the lessons are learned, that, that, that there needn't be another inquiry, or it'll be on a, a, a on a on a smaller part of the of the story. Um, and I don't think it's healthy for politicians. You know, I think we're quite careful not to. Um, you know, criticising people right, left, and centre just for the advice that they've given me. I think you, know, you, you, you don't want people to feel that everything they do in the future, it, it, the, the, that an inquiry is, is a deterrent. Uh, uh, but I do think that it, it is healthy, and I think it was necessary, when you have something that has divided the country as much as Iraq did, the, it's, it's a way of dealing with that problem. Um, the country was incredibly divided. I mean, the, another lesson is, is it's, you've got to be very sure of yourself to go to war with such a divided country. Um, and in those circumstances, I think it, that this was a good response. But you know, the, it, uh, if there is another inquiry, all I can say is I won't be volunteering. <laughs> <laughs> I, saw some, I saw some hands up over here. There was David there. David Ehrman, uh, former civil servant at uh, King's College. Laurie, great talk, plenty to reflect on, and you illustrate how much we're all in your debt. My question is this. Ships have log, keep logs, military formations keep unit diaries and war diaries. Is there a case for the National Security Council appointing a qualified historian as a watchkeeper when things start to really boil up. To, because nowadays, even now, the, the files will not be, for the future historian, what they used to be. I think that, I mean, I've heard that argument made before. I know, uh, and Margaret may correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, in, in, I mean, the point was made in 1990, 91, and I don't think it happened. Um, uh, I think there really is a case. You have to be careful. Um, I think, you know, there's something about randomness which is quite helpful as well as a hindrance. Uh, you know, the, the exciting thing for a historian is always a thing that's crept in that you, that you know you were never really expected to see. Um, or the stuff, that, you know, the stuff that, 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 that was kept out of one file but somehow there's a copy exactly. in another file. Yeah. Um, so um, a part of me is nervous about it being too methodical. Uh, that being said, an awful lot of stuff gets lost. An awful lot of stuff gets lost. And especially in this day and age. Um, you know, one of the things that struck me about the Falklands, uh, people talk about emails now. One thing that struck me, how few telephone transcripts there were. There were hardly any. You know, there were transcripts of the Prime Minister's conversations with foreign leaders. Um, uh, there was one, I think, with, with Lord Carrington just before the action started. And there was an incredibly revealing one 
of a, uh, of a conversation with Tony Parsons, who was then our ambassador in New York. And so much, you get so much out of that single conversation about what she was feeling, about the pressures, uh, that it just wasn't available anywhere else, because that's what you're missing. I think we found that all, you know, in the end, all decisions are recorded. Um, if there's a real decision has been taken, in a way it's recorded, and there's word of mouth, but, you know, there's a, somehow or other you can work out at some point, somebody, sometimes there isn't a decision because an assumption changes without people realising it, but you can work a lot of that out. But what you miss is the little vignettes, um, you know, the bits of colour, and they were far more available when I was looking at the Falklands. Um, I mean, you, know, you would get the Foreign Office discussions about the Chiefs of Staff meetings, which were priceless, I think. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it, it's, it's far less as it is recorded. Of course, there's one agency that records everything, but that's not the one that we, that we can always quote so much. Thank you. It was Matt over there. Come in. Come in that way. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Matt Ross, Global Government Forum. I was just wondering if, as you observe these conflicts over time, you've seen any shifts in the way that civil servants influence decision-making in kind of their expertise or their organisation or how seriously they're taken or what happens when they uh, raise potential objections that may be unpopular. How has that relationship changed over time? David's a better person to answer than that than I am. Um, uh, and Richard sitting behind him. Uh, 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 I, uh, it's a good question. I'll, I'll let me put it like this. I mean, I think you know, Kevin, Richard, David, others here are representatives of a generation um, that were Paul Mill people. Um, they, uh, whatever jobs they had at different stages of their careers, there was an underlying specialism. Uh, that they kept on coming back to. Um, and I think that was an incredibly valuable resource uh, because they'd seen things and done things and they knew people and they had networks in the US um, uh, that uh, allowed them to bring judgment. I think if, you've, if you're constantly transferring people I'm thinking it's absolutely wonderful that everybody's a generalist. Um, then you lose the specialist expertise. Um, and I think that is a difference. Um, I mean, there are people around who, who have uh, obviously had uh, great experience and, and they're invaluable. But it would have been good to have had more of them around um, uh, in 2002, three. I think it would be good to have had more of them around now. Um, so, I mean, I, you know, I'm in no position to comment about how the National Security Council is working or anything like that. But I, I do think there is something to be said for a cadre <coughs> of officials who have worked their lives in a particular area, in different jobs, but in a particular area, who have got real expertise and know about stuff. And it's fine to have the generalists around. They're good too. But, but, but you, you need that expertise. Thank you. Andrew. Uh, that was an excellent talk, Louis, very interesting, and you completely persuaded me of the value of official histories and having access to the fullest possible range of sources and doing the best possible job in uh, telling the story and trying to draw lessons. I wonder whether you re if re reflect, though, on, on the value of the inquiries themselves. I was hard put to think of any inquiry that's made a blind bit of difference to what's actually happened in, in the future. I mean, Reflecting on the history of inquiries, the most damning inquiry in, uh, in history, I suppose, in recent history, was the Dardanelles Commission on Winston Churchill, <coughs> who proceeded to become the saviour of his country as a, as a military decision maker and strategist a, a generation later. It didn't finish his career, and probably it was a good thing that it didn't. The most impactful inquiry uh, discuss uh, was uh, the setting up of the Roebuck Commission in, uh, in 1855, which brought down Aberdeen and, if, and brought a premature end to the 
Crimean War, but it wasn't the report of that inquiry that had any impact, which nobody remembers much at all. It was the decision to set it up while the war was actually going on that brought down Aberdeen's government. And it was the decision to set up an inquiry while the war was going on because there was such massive dissatisfaction with the course of the war that had the impact. And I was reflecting in the, um, in the more recent examples that it might be the de determination of, uh, of Parliament to exert itself during the course of, uh, of, um, of, of a conflict because there's such profound dissatisfaction that has the impact, not actually the findings, which of course is precisely what happens in May 1940 when massive dissatisfaction with the Norway campaign led essentially to the House of Commons setting itself up as a court of inquiry in, in very short order dispatching Chamberlain in much the same way as Roebuck had in 1855. But there wasn't any proper process of, uh, of investigation, nor could there have been. It was, it was a snap decision. Yeah, um, <laughs> if I, I mean... I mean, Churchill never brushed off the Dartmouth inquiry. It, 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 it preoccupied him somewhat uh, for some time. Um, so, um, you know, it, it's always the case with Churchill that, that uh, because he was so right in the 30s, he rescued his reputation. But um, if he'd been knocked over in 32, the Dartmouth inquiry would still probably loom large in the record. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's. Yeah, I didn't set this one up. I, I think I would say the value, the value is um, twofold. First, it was a way of dealing with um, a, a, sort of a, a national wound, put it that way. Um, this issue was around. Um, it wouldn't go away. You can still, I mean, it's still... There are clearly in debates within the Labour Party. Uh, but I think the inquiry did, in, I mean, some, uh, more than one person wrote to me saying, You've drawn the poison. And whether we did or not, I don't know. But I think it helped in that process um, because we set it all up. Secondly, and this is sometimes made as an accusation. Um, Generations of PhD students will get enormous amounts from this. Uh, 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 that is, you know, if you now want to know about what happened, the material's there. Um, this wasn't a short, uh, succinct, uh, it wasn't a Hutton type you know, series of judgment. This was um, the information is out there, and if you want to do Try to understand what happened. Even disagreeing wholly with the inquiry's conclusions, you can do so. Um, and it is an important event in our political history. Um, and that important event can now be better understood, even if you do no more than look at the documentation and the evidence uh, and ignore our conclusions. I think that's valuable. Um, I think that the lessons learned, we'll see. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I think, uh, you know, the instrumentality of these sort of events, given, given the... You know, it's like asking about the Bloody Sunday inquiry. Um, uh, I mean, did it do its job or not? In the end, when it came out, people seemed satisfied that it had laid to rest something that had been niggling away for some time. So I, 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 I wouldn't say they... Um, you know, I wouldn't go overboard on, on the process, but I think to say that they have no value, apart from you know, sort of slightly worrying me about a tenth of my life, um, is, um, is it, and they do have a role. And I, and I, and I think we, in the way that we could do it now, also, of course, you know, because it's online, which I think does make a real difference, because it's online, I think people who are bothered by this, interested in this, want to find out more about it. I mean, just to give you one small example. Um, when uh, the Daily Report was published, we met um, in the morning with families. It was from one of the prime movers um, of having an inquiry. It was a brief family. Whether 
you know, and, and you know, they were, in there was um, a brother of somebody who'd been killed, and we were chatting, and he said, gosh, for the first time I can see what was happening when I was serving. Because he'd been in the army too. And I can now see what was going on um, at the same time. And I never understood why we have to do that. Now I can see. I thought that was fine. No, that was good. And maybe it wasn't worth whatever the, the inquiry cost just for that thing. But it showed for, for, for one, you know, not just the satisfaction to a bereaved family, but actually for a guy who'd fought um, of knowing what had happened. A number of officers, younger officers, I think, thought it was very important um, that there was some sort of exposure of the decision making because they were the ones who had to suffer the consequences. And they, you know, so I think the satisfaction people may get from it may not be quite as advertised, but nonetheless real. Okay, we've got five five minutes, and I want three questions. So, so quite quickly, one right there. Yeah, Thomas Reid, uh, War Studies. Very quick question <clears throat> on uh, 1980s Cold War history. The Soviets had a multi-billion budget for what then what was then known as active measures to forge press stories and documents and whatnot. Are there any meaningful implications for historians of that uh, period for the forgeries? <laughs> Certainly meaningful implications for a historian of the moment, isn't it? Um, um, Probably here tonight. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I mean, there was in the four clues uh, some evidence of um, Russian attempts to stir the pot. Um, there, there was, I mean, there were active measures. Um, to persuade the Argentinians that we were up to no good. Um, I can't remember all of them, but I don't I mean, some of the Belgrano stuff they were obviously encouraging as well. And there's not to say that the Belgrano controversy was a Russian plot, but, but they, um, they played with, with these things. Um, a lot of the stuff about um, the, you know, the role of UK nuclear uh, attack submarines, um, and they were playing upon it. So, you can see it. You can see it at work. And this was reported uh, by our embassies and so on. It wasn't, uh, I mean, they could see it at work as well. Um, with Iraq, I don't... Uh, you know, we're not in a better position than I. When you think of anything you want where we have a bit of sort of Russian active measures, I can't think of anything in particular. Thank you. Uh, Robert Orchard of King's two-pronged question on, uh, on uh, the Falklands. We could have lost the Canberra. We could have had more Exocet missiles taking out ships. Prince Andrew's helicopter could have been shot down. How close did we come to actually losing the Falklands War? And on the Chilcot report, you say you drew the poison. The biggest public debate and anger was whether Tony Blair lied. You didn't find that. Do you think, as a historian, long-term, Tony Blair's reputation will benefit from the results of Chilcot? <laughs> <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> um, well, okay, yeah, there he is. Um, we could have lost the Falklands. Um, now, one of the things, you know, I, I think, to be fair to the chiefs, they were always pretty clear about the risks. Um, I mean, the loss of Fearless, you know, 600 troops have gone down on Fearless or so, that would do. So I think the loss of any major item, and Cameron was lucky, as, as we know. And Argentina made big mistakes. You know, they should have. They put far too many troops in the Falklands, more than they could supply. They didn't build a runway when they could have built a runway. Um, you know, so it's a war, I mean, and things happen in war. So uh, it, it was one, probably one of the most closely fought um, in which we've been involved since '45, um, and. You know, it, 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 I mean, we were never going to lose the Iraq war in 2003 because just the balance of forces was not going to permit it. <laughs> Struggle with what happened afterwards, but that was a different question. Um, you know, I, I think I, I, it's, it's impossible to say about um, Tony Blair's reputation. Um, you know, I have my own views about what he could, could have done. Uh, earlier to address some of the issues 
we addressed. We tried to provide, you know, you could understand as you read the report why he took the decisions he did. You can also see the consequences of those decisions. And I, th and I think, you know, one of the things we tried to avoid was lots of adjectives. Um, you know, it, it, we set it out. We, we set out and the basic uh, critique was that the, um, we went to war um, before the diplomatic process was over and without wider international support. And that cost us. And that was the judgment he took. Um, so that's what, you know. So, so, so I think, to me, the question of, of the judgment is more important than the question of the lies. Uh, I don't, you know, he's a, he's, he's a trained barrister. He's an advocate. He's, you know, he's in advocacy mode all the way through this. And I think he was, uh, and that's how he was, was dealing with it. Um, and you know, so information that seemed to support his case he would seize on, stuff that didn't support his case he would um, not pay so much attention to, but that, you know, people do that, it's, it's confirmation bias. Um, so I think you know, in the end it's a question of judgement rather than uh, being misleading. And a last question right there, please. Uh, hello, uh, I'm not a historian, I should immediately say. Uh, I'm now in my fourth career as a local, newly minted local councillor, uh, unfortunately in the Prime Minister's uh, constituency, so the wisdom of foresight becomes very important. And so your mention of the link between history and the news was particularly relevant. And what I was wondering is we now have growing interest in behavioural economics. Is there anything like behavioural informatics that's growing somewhere? Or do you think that there would be some call for that? Well, I mean, I think uh, it, it, with, with my more academic pattern, um, yeah, I'm really interested in, you know, much confirmation bias. I mean, behavioural, uh, what we now know about how our brains work uh, does affect the way that people view policy making and, and how policies are decided, the difficulty politicians have when they're committed to something uh, to accept it can all go horribly wrong. There's, I mean, there's all sorts of things that you can understand. And no doubt, um, I mean, whether or not there'll be an official inquiry into Brexit one day, uh, one, one <laughs> can, uh, uh, you know, what, what, what is interesting for the historians um, will be, I think, the way the people on both sides of the argument have adjusted to the developing realities of what's happened. Because well, here we are in one of those rare situations where lots of predictions were made about what would or would ha not happen should we vote to leave the EU. And here we are, we're, we're in the middle of this big experiment. So I think it's all, you know, I think there are new techniques of, of use that, that we can use now. One thing we didn't do, we couldn't do, we shouldn't have done, was to try to sort of psychoanalyze the main uh, participants or sort of do our own profiling of them. That, 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 you know, we have to take, them, take these decisions as you find them. But I think for students of politics, uh, there's lots there. So it brings an end to the 21st uh, Strand Group Seminar. The next will take place on the 2nd of May. Uh, the 20th anniversary of New Labour coming into government, uh, where we will uh, have uh, a seminar on uh, the decision to give operational independence to the Bank of England uh, with Ed Balls, Lord McPherson, uh, Tom Scholar, John Cunliffe, and several others. Um, a very big thank you to the British Academy for this evening. Thank you, Alan. Do join us for a drink and also join me in thanking two giants of contemporary British history. Peter Hennessy and Laurie Friedman. Thank you.